Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Faces in FinOps podcast powered by ProsperOps. I'm your host, John Meyer. Faces in FinOps podcast is about highlighting thought leaders in the cloud financial management space and insights on how they're making an impact not only within their organization, but as the broader FinOps community. Today's guest is Stephen Old, also known as Stevo. Stevo is the global head of FinOps at Evident, as well as a co-founder of What's New in Cloud FinOps podcast. And his background varies from gaming to chefing and everything in between. Please join me in welcoming Steve-O to the show. Steve, thanks for joining me. Thanks so much for having me, John. Uh, and <laughs> thanks for such a, a, a kind and enthusiastic intro. Okay, do I call you Steve or Steve-O or Stephen Old? Any and all are fine. The only thing I'd, in the north of England, there's a particular part of the north of England that shortens Steve to Stee as if there's a difficulty making the v noise at the end. And that's the only one that gets me. But Steve and Steve-O, uh, Steve are all absolutely fine. Most people do call me Steve-O just because there's so many Steves in the world. Well, I'll call you Steve-O probably. I, I like the name, right? So I'm digging it. I'm digging the uh, fun and humor behind it. <laughs> Steve-O, th this uh, podcast, Faces and FinOps podcast, is really about highlighting you, members of the community, right, around cloud financial management, FinOps. And before we actually get started in that, how about you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so um, like I said, Stephen Old, I've got quite a varied background. Uh, I live in the, the north of England now, uh, closest to Manchester. That's probably the city people will know. Um, married one one little boy who is um, the most exciting and the most challenging thing that's ever happened to me. Uh, I have like a really very background. I, my first job um, was as a climbing instructor. I then have uh, gone on and been trained chef and run uh, restaurants and hotels. I made online games as a teenager for free. So I have this mix of kind of business and uh, technical. And then, you know, from running business, you kind of get the finance side. And eventually I kind of found my way into uh, cloud transformation. And I just found actually doing the maths of it really interesting. And from there, uh, we kind of build out, uh, this was a few companies ago, built out a cloud economics function. This is before it was called uh, FinOps and then kind of went on to more and more FinOps roles before suddenly I found out I was a, a global head of FinOps, whatever, whatever that means. Okay, Steve-O, you have a podcast, you like climbing. I actually started out, uh, I wasn't an instructor for climbing, but I loved going indoors into the rock climbing gym. We're going to have to talk about that on the side, but I really want to know about this podcast real quick, just because of being a fellow podcaster. Yeah, so it started out as, um, I, I did a podcast uh, years ago, which was just trying to keep up with the news from AWS because there was so much. And so um, people know Corey Quinn, he does his, his Twitter feed, but it was just, you know, which bits are really interesting if you're in the DevOps world at the time. And so me and a friend did it. And then uh, when I moved more into the FinOps side and I moved to a new organization, I, I made a very close friend, uh, Frank, who's on the t-shirt. The and um, we was like, it is, it is a task to keep up with the news that is FinOps related and generally a bit more boring than keeping on top of like the DevOps stuff, which was always quite exciting and new. So we kind of said, well, let's try to make it exciting for ourselves. Let's go out, do the research, do the pod together. We'll share what's new. And then as time's gone on, we used to get people to kind of come do a segment at the end where they'd come and talk about something interesting, you know, doing functions as a service or like doing uh, like true serverless and how that's helped their FinOps journey. And now what's happened in the end is we've got people kind of wanting both things, but in more detail than we're doing. So we now have one news episode per month and one interview episode a month where we kind of get one of the people we know or a rock star from the FinOps world who know far more than we do to come and tell us about a particular thing that they're they're passionate about. So we've been doing it for, I don't know, two and a half years now, probably, maybe even approaching three. Um, and yeah, it's uh, it's just great fun to do, you know, spending time with one of my, my best friends uh, talking about the, the subject that we're passionate about. Well, if you're not subscribed to it, I suggest you actually su subscribe to the FinOps Guys podcast. I enjoy it. In fact, when I was talking with Steve-O a couple of weeks ago, he mentioned, I'm like, how comes I didn't know about it? Don't worry. You just earn a subscriber to it. <laughs> Great to have. Um, and yeah, it's it's just, uh, I gave a talk last week at, at an, uh, a FinOps uh, Foundation event. And it was just, people just coming up and saying, hey, you know, thanks for the podcast. It's just a really nice, nice thing. We kind of, to an extent, sound selfish. We do it for ourselves to keep us learning. Um, but it's it's great that people are listening to it and actually finding it useful. I do the same thing. I create podcasts and content to learn about it and then share it. 
Steve-O, how about you tell us a little bit about the company you're at or the organization and specifically your title and role within it? Yeah, cool. So I'm in a company called Evident. Uh, we are a new company that's been spun out of a, a global company called Atos. Uh, so Atos is splitting in two, keeping its kind of data center business together in, in one piece, which is going to remain being called Atos. And the new piece is all our cloud capabilities. It's our big data and our security stuff. I'd say the, the cool, fun sexy stuff is uh, coming across to evident i'm sure the data center guys strongly disagree uh, but that's kind of my view of the world right that's the world i live in and so um it is a kind of a amalgamation of a bunch of um of different acquisitions over time so i was at a company called cloud reach there's a company called maven wave and so there's a bunch of these and we're trying to bring all the best practice we've got in all our different areas together into one organization to offer end-to-end -end services uh, for customers so it's a mix of kind of advisory build and runners is that kind of how we describe it in terms of where i fit there i'm the head of finops so uh, i help people anywhere on that journey so i do a mixture of consulting work i do uh, helping people build uh, efficient workloads and then we help people keep them you know uh, bringing the best value in life as well and so i've got a team of about uh, about 20 uh, who are global and uh, one of the best teams I've worked with uh, who I don't really have to worry about what they do. They all know their stuff. I learn off them as well as the, the, the alternatives. And it's such a big space, right? You've got to have people that have expertise in different areas. And that's the great thing about being a company of this size, which is a bit different for me. It's like 55,000 people. My biggest before that was maybe 2,000. So it's a whole different ball game. But any question you have, there'll be someone in the company who knows the answer. Steve-O, can you describe to me your organization's FinOps journey? Yeah, well, it's an interesting one. So at the moment, we're going through this whole phase of uh, trying to amalgamate several quite large businesses together anyway, right? So in some ways, we've got pockets that are pretty well established arguably in the in the run phase certainly look after our own stuff you know a mix of, of walk and run um and then we try to impart to customers as much of that as we can and it depends on where they're you know we're trying to match their journey quite often in the service we're delivering to them and trying to pull them along but a lot of our own stuff you know we're trying to keep in in good uh nick as i'd say in, in a good situation so i had a look yesterday for instance and i think there were in terms of low-hanging fruit across our internal account for for my part of the business about 20 dollars of savings so we're really happy with that we have good visibility we're looking at what we should be spending and actually my team find when the cloud vendors invoices incorrectly because we deal with so much data we we know how it should be and we find errors and that's a great thing from from that team that they're able to do so in some areas we're very very advanced um still plenty to learn and plenty to do and more things we can be doing but in the low-hanging fruit sectors we're really neat and tidy but then we start integrating different parts of the business who either work very differently or maybe just didn't have a FinOps service attached to it because of how it was treated in that part and so it just has like a base level of visualization and so the great thing about being able to go in and talk to organizations about where they are in their journey is that we also ourselves have very varied parts of our journey um the guys across in north america that we've got uh, maven wave really hands-on really detailed kind of finops in the devops cycle so really some great kind of walk run stuff going on there other parts of the business are supporting people who are really mode one and so you know even right sizing takes change windows and all this kind of stuff so that's what makes it interesting we've got this whole variance and even though parts of the journey might be up here my job over the next year or so is actually getting everyone to the same stage uh, and so we'll be reliving the same journey probably several times in different places um, and hopefully you know, learning from it each time so the rank of maturity for your organization between the crawl, walk, and run, you're saying that, you know, in some variations you're in the walk and some you're in the run. Can you be in multiple maturity stages throughout your FinOps journey? Absolutely. Especially when if you kind of break down the FinOps framework, maybe if you look at, uh, let's keep it really simple, uh, inform, optimize, and operate. You could be really advanced in the inform stage, so the visualization and view stage, while not actually maybe getting 
there in the other section. So quite often, one of the first things that happens in an organization is they really focus on getting the visibility piece there, getting the recommendations there, but they then struggle to get action taking place. And there's no automation around that. So you can absolutely have different parts of your, uh, even in the same department, different parts of your journey um, at different stages of core work run, just about which pieces you've focused on. And we find quite often organizations, especially with the tooling they may choose, that will somewhat dictate where they are in their journey. If you choose a tool that's really good at tagging, you're going to be over there. If you've got a tool that's all about automated optimizations, then actually your optimize phase and operate might be further on, but maybe actually not as good as the visualization side. And so actually your inform is 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 lacking. And so it's very normal for you to be there. And I found um, Natalie Daly was on the stage at FinOps X fantastic fantastic uh finops person one of the true rock stars i'd say and she was saying that actually you can be in run and if you just stay as you are you'll fall into walk because the whole program and the world of finops is moving that quickly that staying still is going to mean you're actually falling backwards on the journey that's an interesting perspective yeah. because you can only run so much and then you've matured really well that it's actually going to put you in kind of the walk thing where you're just kind of making tweaks as you go along and redoing it. And you're hopefully not, I guess, in my opinion, hopefully not going to the run stage after you've had a mature thing because it will be efficient. Hmm. And some of it's got to be as well, there will be new things that would be classed as run. So at the moment, you know, if you're doing really well on automated right sizing, termination, all of this, and that's all automated super, then at the moment, compared to most people, because let's face it, crawl, work, run is a comparison matrix. It's around where you fit against the market for these areas. But as the market improves, the things that class you as run are going to move across, and actually they're going to become the standard. So I would generally say um, Natalie and her team are some of the people at the cutting edge. Um, but they are now making what the new run looks like, if that makes sense. So just doing what they were doing a year ago, when that was definitely run, might only put you in walk now. And that's what I find really interesting about it. And you, because every organization is different, you're only going to face some challenges. So there are only going to be some areas where you are at the, the cutting edge. And so you might move this part forward and a different organization move this forward. And hopefully with a true open community, you know, it's what me and Frank are about. That's why we share all this. And, you know, that's what the foundation's there for. And, um, you know, podcasts like this are for people are sharing what is driving them, what they're improving. And that should hopefully, therefore, share around to everyone's practices improving over time. Well, that's the whole point of obviously the Faces and FinOps podcast is for the community and sharing a lot of that. And I think the whole FinOps community and sharing, you know, uh, best practices, lessons learned and everything is really helping everybody. Steve-O, you were talking about, you know, the automation, tagging. Tagging is actually a whole separate podcast oh, that yeah. you and I have to get into. I, I have thoughts on it. I have pros and cons. Uh, we'll, you and I, we'll set one aside for that. <laughs> okay. But uh, let's talk about the automation of not only are you using automation within your company for tagging, for right sizing, or doing some of the work that's there, and the AI. And I'm not talking generative AI. I'm just talking AI in general. Yeah. So I gave a talk on, on this a couple of weeks ago. There's an interesting challenge at the moment where if you're using infrastructure as code, and then you're using automation tooling. What's generally happening is it's creating drift because the tool goes and makes a change. But if that's not reflected in your templates, the next time you run them, actually you'll undo that change. And so there's a real gap in the market or just a challenge now based on, depends on how you're using infrastructures, how this how this stuff works. So like true end-to-end -end automation is quite, quite challenging at the moment, certainly in the DevOps world. What needs to start happening, and this doesn't happen at the moment, or we're not doing this at the moment, is that, um using ai to work out how you change your templates that should drop into your ci cd pipeline and, and so recommendations will get driven in that way and that's where i think ai can majorly work it at the moment in terms of where we're using ai um one of the biggest challenges people have is things like forecasting ai is a very neat way of doing that especially if you're doing um i think where people kind of get lost with AI is they just lob loads of data at it and, and it's not meaningful and then they hope it will give it meaning. If you go in with some decent metrics you can for your forecast then you can drive that through AI. Recommendations are somewhat 
for most tools driven by a logic engine. But over time, if you review the metadata of which ones get approved and why, AI can start looking at where you should be targeting, which ones are most likely to happen, which is one of the biggest problems in the people are facing. Um, other automation areas we have are things like things that we know are going to be no impact, probably don't need loads of approval, you know, killing off uh, EBS volumes or doing certain start stop scheduling for workloads that we know are, are suitable for that that are tagged to be suitable for that, then absolutely let AI go away and manage that. Certainly around scheduling, like you should just have intelligent scheduling uh, where possible, where it's actually being decided based on usage when it gets switched off and switched off rather than uh, purely uh, something that's mandated to a, a very simple on off uh, situation. That's another great area to be using AI. Um, there are still plenty of challenges with uh, with both automation and AI in FinOps because it all depends on how how you're interacting and, and part of the problem the cloud market has at the moment is that there are really still two true schools of how people are interacting with infrastructure and so tools are largely focusing on the one where the money is which is mode one which is basically people using cloud largely like it was a data center and so the mode two stuff's being a little bit uh ignored but that's where the that's where you can start doing the really interesting ai stuff in my view that's the maturity and immaturity. And speaking of that, one of the challenges that you indicated was the forecasting and reporting. Do you see this as challenges for an immature or a mature FinOps team and culture? Um, it's certainly a massive challenge for immature organizations, people just getting to it, just the whole change in how the billing happens, the financial process and all of this. But I, I've seen people who, in terms of the actual cloud usage can be quite mature. But their forecasting and budgeting is uh, basic. I, I, I won't insult it, I'll call it basic because that's all that maybe they need at, at this point. But where that goes wrong is that if you're not forecasting and budgeting correctly, it's very hard to define meaning and value, which is what FinOps is around. You know, people think it's just about cost optimization, but it's not, it's about proving value from your cloud, right? And so if you haven't got meaningful budgets or forecasts, it's very hard to then compare that to the value that's being delivered and versus how you're doing against those things. So it's, it's a, a bit of a revelation to me over the last maybe six months, how important this is, because I've always been focusing elsewhere in my mind. Um, but very few organizations are really doing this well in my eyes so even people who are maybe doing it better than the basic still generally have a lot of areas where they can improve and then gain some efficiencies from it um, and it's all about whether cloud is a meaningful number to them right and if it's a meaningful number hopefully then they will start giving meaningful effort to change how they do their forecasting and budgeting so if I agree with you, the data that's actually pulled for FinOps and making this reporting and forecasting, it's great, but it has to be meaningful. You have to understand the data, know what to do with the data. Or if they put together this and they're like, I, I don't know what all this data is. How do I make it meaningful in order to provide action to actually funnel this out to the rest of the teams to report on it correctly? So I'm right there with you that, on that one. Yeah, it, it's a, it, I did a, a talk to uh, AWS sellers, I think it was, about how to speak to a CFO and the problems that they don't probably realize that they bring to a CFO. And one of those is quite simply, go and look at what a bill looks like and how complicated that may seem. And then go look at what the cost and usage data, which is meant to be what brings light to this bill looks like. And between those two things, if you can make sense of it, then I think you're ready to start speaking to a CFO. If you can't, then we need to have a conversation about how you have a meaningful conversation because that's the pain you're bringing to their lives. Uh, have a talk for a meaningful conversation on how to talk to your CFO and understand <laughs> it. But if you could understand what the cur looks like, the raw bill, and actually understand the AWSN, you will be a guru within the community because there's very few who can understand and read it. Frank can. I'm not going to claim I can. I know enough to be dangerous, but Frank really knows his data stuff. It is uh, it is a science in in itself. And uh, Frank has a very interesting point, I always think. He says, if the cloud vendors just sorted out their billing data to make it simple, none of us would have jobs. And I think that's an interesting one because actually- That's very true. Yeah, <laughs> if they just sorted it out, FinOps would be a much smaller topic than it is. 
but it's because it's so complicated. They've basically created a market of jobs for people. I like it. Well, thank you, cloud providers, for yeah. making complex <laughs> <Yeah>. bills. <laughs> And it hugely complicated billing data that's not even like for like across the different vendors. It is oh, multiple science. If they made it like for like, then they would all, they each have to have their own way of doing it. Yeah, of uh, like AWS will have a line item for like your RIs and then you'll have your discount on another line item way down and you won't understand how they correlate to each other. It's always, I've always found it amusing because if you do multi-cloud like I have to do, right, and then you go on a call and let's say I'm speaking to one vendor, I'm not going to name them because it's, it'd be far too easy. I'm speaking to one vendor and I kind of go, this isn't in your data, but it's in that other vendors. How annoying must that be to hear? And it's just like, well, for this reason, we haven't put it in there. We're like, well, they put it in and I like it. Why can't you put it in? Um, these kind of pieces, like I say, it's all different and that they have their reasons. Uh, but it would be so nice if it was standard. And that's kind of the big focus uh, topic that's coming out of the FinOps Foundation around the FinOps Open standard for um, cost and usage data. That that would be massive if it, if it really takes off. So Steve, you were actually the first FinOps hire within your organization. What are the first three things that you've done or you're going to do? So I wasn't the first one here. Well, I, I kind of was in evident, if that makes sense, but in, in CloudReach, we already had it. So it's a bit of a mixed one, but in this one, I'm trying to place myself, new job tomorrow, going somewhere new, what am I gonna, what am I gonna do? Um, the first thing is like, get the data. Like, we've just been talking about what a mess and, and how difficult it is, but without good data, without getting some history and without getting that visualization piece, you can't do anything you are playing blind. Any decisions I make would be guesswork. The next I would uh, attack is get budgets sorted. Um, I have no idea what state we're in and whether we're doing as well or worse than expected if I don't have the budget. So I need my, if we think about my budgets and my forecasts being my guardrails, I need to check whether my data that I've collected is within or not within these guardrails and how those guardrails are changing to match growth of the organization over time. And then uh, I, I listened to a talk from the guys at Nationwide around uh, something called COIN, which is Cost Optimization Index Score, which is a fantastic thing. And I think if I went into any organization, I would do something very similar, where it looks at the total spend versus the low hanging fruit uh, opportunities and then creates a score from that. Um, don't want to go into too much detail because it's, it's their, their work, not mine. But that would allow me to like traffic light where I should be spending my time. Hey, these guys have got a terrible score. These guys have got quite a good score. Who am I going to go and speak to first? The people with the terrible score. So I just know where I would find my quick wins, where the biggest, uh, like I, I kind of consider cloud spend being, and, and FinOps have, have been trying to keep a leaky bucket full of water, right? So where are my big holes where money's just being splashed out uh, versus my budgets? I'll go focus on those first. I actually like that method, the coin for the it's, index, it's amazing. and you can do your focus on those quick wins. I think that might be a, a new thing to add or whatever. I'm going to have to look that up. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if their talk is live yet on the on YouTube uh, from the from the event, um, but I did write about it a little bit in, in the article. I wrote my, my thoughts from FinOps, and I checked what I wrote there with the people that gave the talk, and they were happy for me to share that amount of detail. Um, and yeah, just... I, a really very good talk by very good speakers, but also just genius in its simplicity. Don't overcomplicate it. Give yourself a level playing field where you can benchmark everyone and start start going after those big flashing red lights. I like that. Sivo, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I want to actually talk about your FinOps journey and your current role at your organization. We talked just a little on how you actually became into the head of FinOps. So you were at another company mm -hmm. and in this role, can you tell us a little bit more about it and what your team's responsible for? Yeah, so um, I was leading a transformation consultancy, got an interest in the cloud economics piece, moved to a FinOps company specifically uh, who focused on kind of rate um, discount types um and learned a, a lot about that a, a very boring amount about that for anyone else and then moved on to this more kind of a generic role um and my my mandate when i joined was to create a a world-class finops function that was my idea for both ourselves internally and for our customers um what's 
you know that's still our drive and our focus and and what i hadn't realized at the time but like i learned from natalie daily from hsbc is actually you don't stay at the you don't work out what you want to do do that and then stay at the top because it's constantly moving kind of backwards as as run keeps adapting um so my team do several things within the organization. We, because we're a partner, we actually look after resale, so customers that buy cloud through us. And this ends up being quite uh, FinOps adjacent as a concept. It's all about billing data. It's all about uh, kind of controls and governance. So we end up looking after a lot of that. Part of my team does the actual billing data for customers and works out what they should be invoiced. Again, hugely cost and usage data driven. So they're kind of like my data team because they're spending a load of time in the raw data. So if I ever have things I need to check and stuff like that, I can just go and have a team who are flooded and, and swimming in cost and usage data from the three uh, major hyperscalers. And then we are looking after our own internal estates of which it's quite significant, a company of 55,000 people, as you can imagine, there's quite a lot of cloud going on, especially in cloud businesses, um, where we might be doing our own POCs. We actually own some softwares ourselves and stuff like that. We have things on the marketplaces. So we've got all of that kind of stuff, which we have a very routine FinOps relationship with. So we are the people that are going to the owners of those apps and saying, hey, you could do this to save that and, and that kind of thing and making sure they've got the visibility they need and, and doing that. So we are our own customer, if that makes sense. That's a place we do a lot of learning. Um, and then we look after external customers. Some of those people that have resale with us, people that take managed services with us, um, we are their FinOps team or we are uh, a join to their FinOps team, whether that's that we try to distill better recommendations, whether it's actually uh, part of my team are, are very embedded in organizations where they may raise the tickets that go into the system so people then go do optimizations. So we, we really vary the level of detail we get into with the customer by customer. Um, but some, some of our team are basically the embedded FinOps person in an organization doing what you would do if you were the person hired by that organization themselves. Nice. Steve, I want to dive in a little bit more in detail on what your team is doing, but more from like a day to day, a week to week or cool. month to month perspective. I envision that uh, as a finance person, I see the data. I'm walking to next person's desk virtually. Yeah. I'm showing them the data saying, hey, listen, you need to do this. They're going to the next. Are you going to business applications? I mean, really, what does your day to day look like? Yeah. So it, it varies heavily by the, the customer. Um, easiest probably to describe the customers that are more like ourselves. So it's very similar to the internal journey, which I can probably talk about more. Uh, but we are looking proactively at the uh, recommendations, looking for anomalies, looking for changes. And then we know who is generally we, we separate by account. So we know who is aligned to that account and we'll go speak to that account owner specifically. If they are maybe a business owner rather than technical owner, we might know who the technical person is as well. And we'd go directly to, to both of them or to one of those. And we just ask if the change was expected, if it's anomaly, speak to them about uh, whether the recommendation is valuable. There is a whole kind of challenge and concept around whether you know, a tool shouts out that you should right size this, but there might be a reason you haven't. And so we need to validate that recommendation before mandating that it be done. And that's where I think a lot of people go wrong. And a lot of C-level turn around and say, hey, you these re there's 100 grand's worth of recommendations, the company needs to go do them. Actually, 50 grand of them probably can't be done for various reasons. And so we are the team that help validate that. So we speak to the people that are the SMEs of the application, we own the uh, recommendation and then we either will kill that recommendation if it's not suitable and, and we agree with them it's not suitable or we'll put that on their list of things to action and so that's where we, we are we also own the purchase and management of rate uh, discounts so ris savings plans commit use discounts etc uh, that generally sits with us sometimes customers like us to recommend that to them and they go purchase some customers like us to purchase obviously for our own stuff we purchase ourselves um or in quite a few customers uh, we partner with you know with prosperops and they actually will do the ri management on our behalf for aws customers um because it's more, it's more efficient than what we can do with savings plans etc so we are largely uh, owning on a day-to-day -day basis the recommendation and the validation of recommendations 
sometimes actioning, quite often passing it on to the technical team to then actually go do the, the work. If they're a managed service customer, we'd be passing it on to our own technical teams who will go and do the work, depending. Um, so that would still be kind of team adjacent. So we'd be overseeing that, but wouldn't be directly doing the right sizing action itself, for instance. So we stay very much in the analyst world rather than the engineering world at the moment. I think just making sense of the data and the reports and the recommendations that come up is like half the battle because like you mentioned, you have a hundred recommendations, you can't do 50 of those, but really, is there a way to say that these 50, you're, you're looking on a piece of paper, are you using a specific tooling or did you create some customized tooling in order to just make this simple? So depending on the tool you use, a lot of the, the bigger vendors out there at the moment still don't have something like a snooze or a delete function, which says, don't show me this again next month, right? Which <laughs> is a pain. So we do that ourselves through some scripting. Uh, so we take the raw data in CSV, we compare it to previous months. If it's been marked as not done, then it will, uh, or, you know, not actioned. And we see it's the same one, it will come in. But the thing is that we're doing that through our own kind of automation, right? And so that, does mean still some, if they have restarted the instance as a different instance ID or stuff like that, it will come back. So it's not perfect. Some of the tools out there, some of the, the ones that have been called ankle biters, but some of the newer, more innovative tools have been built with this inbuilt. And that's the easy way of doing it, is choosing the tools that will do that easily. Because it's one of the, especially if you're manual and you haven't got a tool in place, it is one of the biggest pains is to on a monthly basis go in first disregard everything that you disregarded last month before you start then getting meaningful um, recommendations and if you don't do that people aren't going to listen because they're going to see all the white noise every month and they're not going to see the meaningful stuff and that's kind of part of our responsibility is to try to just demonstrate the meaningful stuff um, that then is more likely to be actioned and, and this is why you get it's not a myth that there's a lack of engineer you know engineers taking action it's absolutely true but as you know, a failed techie slash engineer myself, I'll tell you that quite often it's because it's just a load of noise and you don't know what's what's worth looking at, what's not, because you disregarded half of them three times already. Yeah, because like the first sheet will say all the stuff that you disregarded last month, and you're like, I'm not looking at this anymore. Exactly. Like, I'm done. <laughs> the top three big ones, say you've got a, um, a, a software you buy and it says you have to have a machine this size, right? And everyone knows it doesn't need to be on a machine of that size, but for it to remain in support, it has to be a machine that size. And it's a big machine, yep. right? And they're your top three every month. Every month I look at it, I kind of go, they're still there, <laughs> you know? And I might not get onto number four because I'm just like, they still haven't sorted this report out. What are they doing? Why haven't they disregarded these three? You know, so that's one of the things we try to, try to, um, help organizations with when, when we're involved. Um, we did quite a large tooling review. Um, and so it's still kind of under consideration whether we would look at using a tool that has that inbuilt because it is a game changer. Steve, what are some of the biggest challenges you might be facing right now within your company, within the FinOps? Um, standardization, which I think a lot of big companies have got to have the same issue, right? Um, so if, If you have very varied parts of the organization, getting the same understanding across all of them takes quite a lot of time and often quite a lot of repetition. So it's, it's a constant challenge in any organization, I think, to keep all the parties that touch FinOps interested and involved and understanding what's going on because for a finance person it's maybe two percent of their job right but they've still got to have a base level of knowledge so you've got to work out how you put that across to them help them understand it in a meaningful way that means they can have a meaningful conversation with you or the technical person especially if you're the go-between so standardization of processes uh, when there's acquisitions that's a big challenge uh, standardization of language standardization of um, kind of the way of communicating and the roles and responsibilities is absolutely the biggest challenge I think most people actually face. And sometimes they don't realize that. They kind of think, oh, it's, these people aren't taking action or we're struggling with that. Actually, sometimes it's because people just aren't speaking the same language because they haven't standardized things in their organization. Do you see that automation or AI impacting your role or FinOps in general? I, I think it's got to improve to start augmenting people to do a better job. 
at the moment, and I think most FinOps people would agree, they spend far too much time doing stuff that absolutely could be handled by tools. Things like we've just been talking about, right? Um, I think at the moment there is a gap where some of the FinOps stuff doesn't, uh, the tooling doesn't allow for the Mo2 stuff that would improve. And so there should be a streamlining in maybe the level of analysis I have to go into. Um, but then me and the team could focus more on some of the cultural stuff, some of the actual making action take place. And there's this whole challenge in the whole whole world of cloud where people kind of said, hey, we're going to lift and shift and then we're going to innovate and we're going to re-architect and all of this. If a load of us had more time to actually go and cost that and work that out, that's where the real value comes. How do I do the same thing but better rather than how do I right size all this? How do I change this entire thing to get the same outcome but with a, a significantly superior architecture? And that's where I'd like to be getting to. My background's as an architect, right? That's how I got into the IT side. So I'd be far more interested in time if they can handle some of this analysis stuff I'm doing or certainly some of the stuff that could be automated then I can start working on that because that needs people that needs people's brains to work out how you do it and there's just too many moving parts and too much in terms of the people aspect in that to not have people involved and I've always been a big believer in that like AI can absolutely augment the people but there is still in the FinOps world plenty for us to be doing it will require an upskilling of a lot of the FinOps um, analysts and audience out there because at the moment they're doing stuff that could be automated because it's not been not by the tooling or because the the, uh, the data is too complex and so then they could do things that they'd probably find more enjoyable I know some people just love playing with the, the numbers and the data but there's definitely more more that we could do and more value that FinOps can bring to organizations and improve the sustainability and the, the greenness of what we're doing as well. I actually agree with you on the AI and the automation. While most in fear that like AI is going to take over this or or that, I think it, what it does is it allows us to focus on what's really important to us and allow us to do those key things. Like, okay, uh, the automation. There's so many tools out there to do automation for this, that within you know cost optimization within FinOps, but there's not one tool that can do it. If we can marry up a lot of those to the automation have AI define it, then go do it. We can actually focus on the business and the driven factors on why we need certain things. Yeah. And there's always new roles, new opportunities to grow, and it's just going to expand and it's going to change throughout the use of this. And that's just what I'm feeling from it. Yeah, someone, I gave a talk a while ago, and I'm talking a while ago, maybe four years ago on uh, ML and AI when it was beginning to become more to fruition and someone said you know isn't it going to replace all our jobs what about teachers are they going to be replaced by ai soon and i said no but if you're a teacher and you could get ai machine learning to mark the books how much fresher would you be going into class having not spent four hours that night before marking the books and you just get particular things that are unusual varied brought to your attention to then go review and then you can go speak to that that child about that specifically that you know there are the meaningful tasks that should still be done by people but there are the menial tasks that could be done by by computer i agree i i think that's actually a really good point around it is that the meaningful tasks that you can't replace with ai you can't replace with automation the stuff that has the human perspective Steve, let me ask you one very tough question for you okay and this is what do you want to tell the audience? What is the one thing that you got not only at a FinOps, at a FinOps X that is important to you that you want to share? So I would probably say, I learned a few things at FinOps X, but uh, there was a particular talk which has just gone on YouTube. So absolutely uh, go listen to it by a lady called uh, Ali Whitman. And uh, she's again, she's one of these kind of rock stars of FinOps in my eyes. And she's currently at um, Disney. I'm allowed to say that because it was on the talk. Uh, but she's been at AWS and she was at uh, Pepsi or Coca-Cola before that. I'm really sorry, Ali, that I've forgotten. Um, but she gave a talk on what's the difference between a saving and a spend reduction. And I found that, I, I found it intriguing. That's why I went to the talk. But she made a really good point that if you have a budget of $100 and you're spending $150 and you reduce that spend, by 
$30, you're still overspending by $20 versus your budget. So you haven't saved your company anything. You've just reduced how much you're overspending. And it's this kind of concept that actually, if you're really using budgeting well, if you're using forecasts well, it will make everything a bit more meaningful and where you need to focus your time. And it means you can, you know, a lot of people out there tool say, hey, I made my company a 30% saving. Did you or did you reduce bloated bad spend by 30% that actually still didn't bring you down to where you were budgeted and planned to be? And I'm not saying all budgets are perfect. And I, I've even said this previously. Budgets should be defensible, not, not, not perfect, right? That's the new world in cloud. But if you get to it and you honestly have done all the reductions that is possible and you're still not there, then budgets need reviewing. But we can't just go and turn around and say, hey, I reduced the spend by $10. I've saved the company $10. I'm amazing. When actually you're still $1,000 overspending per month. And it's a real kind of concept of, and if you have that mindset across the organization, that accountability across the organization, people will start budgeting better. People start budgeting better. People start understanding the value of cloud better. People start understanding the better, uh, value of cloud better. People don't start complaining that we're overspending. And that's where it all comes from. I think it comes from this one very basic idea of how important a budget is and that not all spend reductions are a saving. So that's the one thing I would say people should go and go and learn and go and see and li listen to that talk. I actually love that analogy. A, a colleague of mine uh, told me, I was like, I, I love video editing and uh, there's all these cool plugins for it. And I was like, man, I really like this one. Mm -hmm. It's 30% off today. And he's like, is 30% off of something you don't need. It's still 30% more that you're spending or 70% more that you're spending. You don't need to spend. And I'm like, that's a good point. All right. I don't need that plugin, but it was really nice. It's how, it's how supermarkets have, have made their, made their, their livings for years, right? It's, Hey, two for you know, three for two. Well, I only needed one, but now I'm getting a deal. So I'm going to buy three. And you know, yep. it's that kind of concept where there's an artificial, uh, constructs in our minds around what a saving is and all of this and actually it's you just think it's because it's less than it could have been when actually you need to bring it down to what the business should be spending rather than what you are currently spending as to whether it's a saving or just a spend reduction actually i always have that conversation with my wife when we go to the supermarket i'm like oh it's two for three do i need to buy all both of two of them for three or if you only buy one it's like two dollars i'm like well, then I might as well buy the two to get the three dollars. So I'm still overspending a dollar, but I only needed the one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's that, it's that kind of concept. And um, yeah, I thought Ali put it across really well. So uh, yeah, that, uh, I can share the link with you. It's, it's available. I'll tell people to go listen to that because she tells it far better than me. She gives examples with numbers. <laughs> Yeah, of course. So, Steve, I'm going to wrap this up with some two fun questions for you, right? Nothing around the FinOps, but this is actually going to be a cool one. Uh, the first question I have for you is, imagine yourself, you're on an island, and you have the OG of iPods. And for those who don't remember, it's actually a little device that you put music on, and you yeah. can't really connect to anything. You just play music off it. It was really cool. Yeah. The Nanos were awesome. Uh, what songs are you listening to on this island? That's a good question. I, I was heartbroken when my classic eventually died. Um, I kept it going as long as I could. Um, but yeah, when my my uh, my iPod classic died, I was very, very sad. Um, so I'm the kind of person who, as you can, make, can be quite excitable. I think the main thing I've got to do on a, on a desert island or, or wherever this might be, hopefully not freezing cold island, is keep pretty chilled out. Um, or I'd just be running around and expend all my energy. So probably something really classic. I, I've got into recently, while working, I like to listen to music, but if I have uh, lyrics, I, I start talking, then I'll, I'll be typing something and suddenly I've started writing some lyrics down. So I've been listening to a Vitamin String Quartet who do like modern songs as a four piece string quartet. So you're hearing like a violin version of, you know, Go Lucky or something and that kind of stuff. Keeps me pretty chilled. I can still concentrate and do things with it um and so that's probably what i'd go for if i need to be kept serene on a on an island somewhere you ever find yourself with music that does have lyrics to it that you're actually not hearing the lyrics you're just hearing the background the noise and the instruments but you're able to work that uh, yeah some absolutely but mainly albums i've listened to time and time again i have a couple of albums i listen to when i'm swimming now um because i'm a broken old man i can't run or anything i've got to go swimming so i have headphones in for that and for those, 
um, they're ones where I can just enjoy it without, because when you're swimming, it kind of goes in and out slightly. It doesn't bother me. I can't hear the lyrics. I can just enjoy the, yep. the music. And I know like when that ear goes back in, I'm going to hear this, especially when it's, if you think about it being stereo, things are changing on each ear and you can hear it better when each ear is in the water. It gets a bit all over the place. But yeah, absolutely. There are albums I've listened to enough times. I'm the same with um, audio books. I listen to a lot of audio books to help me go to sleep. I need some sort of noise. So it has to be one I've already heard or something like that, because then I, I'm not listening to hear what's next because I already know if that makes sense. I won't ask your best recommendation on an audio book to go to sleep. We'll save that for another time. <laughs> Steve-O, my last question is, who's your personal superhero and why? A bit of a cliche, but um, it's, it's probably it's probably my dad. It's just a very nice man. First person in the family to go to university, that kind of thing. Um, but I always looked at him and kind of like, that's what a grown-up looks like. And now I am a grown-up and I still look at him and go, I'm not as grown-up as my dad. Like, he does monthly jobs and all this kind of stuff. He has he knows how much money's in his wallet from a spreadsheet and that's what i always aspired to being an adult i've now decided i probably don't really want to be an adult if that's what it means um but i still always kind of look up to him and uh, there's a there's a song with a lyric i like which is um always be better than your thoughts are and quite often i kind of think you know what would my dad do in this situation because he'd probably do the nice thing if that makes sense as well as anything else um and he's a lot more patient than i am uh, but also why I needed that serene music. So it's it's probably my, my dad. And we've been through a lot together. You know, um, we lost my mum and stuff like that. And uh, it, it made us very close. So uh, and he's very close to my son now, which is which is really nice as well. Uh, they're like best friends, those two. So probably my dad. Nice. Well, hats off to your dad and being your superhero. <laughs> it's a very difficult thing to achieve. Steve-O, thank you so much for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Well, everybody, this has been another awesome episode and discussion around Faces and FinOps, powered by our good friends at ProsperOps. Be sure to hit that like, subscribe, and notify, and check out our latest episodes with the ProsperOps blog. My name's John Meyer, and I appreciate you watching. And until next time.